Hare Krishna Prabhu, my obeisances to you, all glories to Prabhupada. It's been a great uh, opportunity and a blessing to have your darshan again and also for the sessions today. Recording in progress. Thank you very much for being with us and giving your cosmic mercy. We hope that your health is good and uh, we pray that all will be well with you. And uh, please uh, kindly bless all the students and uh, give them the best of the Mercy from your side, Maharaj. Thank you so much. Hare, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Prabhu. So we'll just share the screen here. Can we? Yes, Maharaj, we, you can do that. Uh, Murli Vadan Prabhu, can you please activate that? Done, Prabhuji. You can activate. Thank you, Prabhu. Okay, so. So welcome everyone to our uh, Bhakti Vai Bab, and we're beginning chapter 20 of the third canto. Chapter 20, titled Conversation Between Maitreya and Vidura. So you've just finished previously, you were hearing about Lord Varaha and the appearance of Lord Varaha. So we heard how Lord Varaha came to pick up the earth from the bottom of the universe. And Son Sonaka begins a chapter like that, inquiring from Sutta Goswami, that after the earth was again situated in its orbit, what did Swami Bhuvamanu do to show the path of liberation for persons who were to take birth later on? So you can see the continuation from the previous section that we want to hear about Manu, Swayambhuva Manu. This is the first Manu in the day of, the, in the day of Brahma and uh, we want to know what did he do to show the path of liberation after the earth because we know after Swayambhuva Manu appeared along with his good wife Satarupa, then they asked Lord Brahma to pick up the earth, that the earth is in the bottom of the universe, could it be restored in its position? So that was arranged by the appearance of Lord Varaha. And after Lord Varaha's Leela, then we want to, he wants to hear, Shonaka is inquiring from Vidura about these things, what happens? How does Manu go about? Uh, uh, establish bringing everyone into the right uh, situation, show the path of liberation. Manu is meant to teach people for their ultimate good. So Shonika also inquires about Vidura. Vidura, the friend of Lord Krishna and a great devotee, who gave up the company of its elder brother because the latter, along with his sons, played tricks against the desires of the Lord. <laughs> so this is the, the family situation, the intrigue which is there in the palace. Every home we have these kind of problems. There will always be some intrigues and difficulties, conflicts between different people. Sometimes it's sisters, sometimes it's brothers, sometimes it's aunts and uncles and so many different things, interactions. So certainly in Hastinapur, when Vidura was living there, there was no shortage of politics and different intrigues. And ultimately, we know, Vidura left home, right? And <laughs> 
Was it right for him to go and leave home? Was it the right thing to do? To go out there? He was there with his family members. Of course, sometimes we have these situations, you know, you have a big quarrel with the family. You say, I'm going, I'm leaving, I'm not coming back. You know, we feel sometimes, you feel sometimes that kind of frustration sometimes. Things are not done the way we want or we don't get what we, the way we want to do things and we feel very disturbed and we think, I can't go on with this life anymore, I'm leaving home, I'm going on my own. So Vidura, he also did like that and Prabhupada notes here, you can see I've marked in the purport there of text number two. He said, as a devotee, Vidura showed, the, he showed by example that Anywhere that Krishna is not honored is a place unfit for human habitation. <laughs> a devotee may be tolerant regarding his own interests, but he should not be tolerant when there is misbehavior towards the Lord or the Lord's devotees. Maybe you can think of some other examples in our scriptures where we see that kind of situation and where also the, the, the devotee left home. Can you think of any other situations where that kind of thing happened? Maybe in the life of the Acharyas? Hare Krishna? Yes, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna Prabhu. Uh, Raghunath Das Goswami case, it's happened. He left his home because he was not allowed to meet to Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Well, uh, I don't think that's quite correct. You can't really say he was not allowed to meet Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. His family didn't want, didn't want him to go and join Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. His family were trying to keep him at home. They didn't want him to just go off and, and become a, a full devotee, <laughs> a full-time devotee. So they, they did try to keep him at home. But there wasn't really any problem there. There was no real intrigues or anything. It wasn't that, you know, his family were also very pious people, you know. They were great devotees. Well, not great devotees, they were kanistas. But they were supporting the Brahmana community in Bengal. That his father and his uncle, Hiranya and Govardhan Majumda, they were supporting the Brahmana community in Bengal by so much charity. They were so wealthy. So, but they just didn't want their son to renounce everything. And Lord Chaitanya, even Raghunath met Lord Chaitanya, and Lord Chaitanya told him, go home and behave like a normal person. He said, keep Krishna in your heart. And in, the, in time, in the future, you'll get the opportunity. But for now, you go home and stay at home. So Lord Chaitanya sent Raghunath back home. And he did. You know, he did that. He behaved like a normal person and family were very pleased. But then later on, Raghunath got the opportunity to, to go to Panihati. And that was also with the permission of his family. They allowed him to go to Panihati and he met Lord Nichinanda. And of course that's the Panihati Shiradahi festival, which is coming in another week, just one week away. We have the Shiradahi Mahotsava. And Raghunath got the mercy, got the blessings from Lord Nityananda. And with the blessings from Lord Nityananda, it wasn't long before he was able to escape from home and go to Puri. But I don't think you could say that he left home just because his family were against the service of Krishna. Oh, well, in some ways it's true because Lord Chaitanya did say that you were very lucky 
to get away from family life. He said, you were like an animal who had fallen into a well. Or you're living in a well where, you were living in a hole where people pass stool. And so Lord Chaitanya, he didn't praise the family. Rather he, he, he told Raghunath, it's good you left them. Okay, but there are other examples. There's the example of Krishna Das Kaviraj. Krishna Das Kaviraj, who is the author of the Chaitanya Charitamrita, he was staying with his brother and a, a great devotee of Lord Nityananda named Mini Ketana Ramdas came to their home. So it happened that the brother of Krishna Das Kaviraj, he was devoted to Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, but he didn't have any faith in Lord Nityananda. He only accepted Lord Chaitanya and he had no faith in Lord Nityananda. And it ended up that his brother insulted Mini Ketana Ramdas. And that night, Lord Nityananda appeared in the dream of Krishna Das Kaviraj and told him, You should leave home. Don't stay here in this house. And the, before, the, before the morning came, Krishna Das Kaviraj woke up and he got out of the house and he left and he never came back. So Krishna Das Kaviraj went to Vrindavan, of course, and there he got the shelter of Rupa and Sanatan. And he heard all the pastimes of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and he could write Chaitanya Charitamrita. So Krishna Das Kaviraj is one example of a person who left home because he saw the home was not, the people at home were not Krishna conscious. They were not, his brother was not a serious devotee. He had offended Lord Nityananda. Another example is also the Ramanujacharya. The Ramanujacharya was in Grihastha life, but his wife was offensive to the Vaishnavas. She was not respectful to other people who were not born in Brahmana families. And when Ramanujacharya saw the behavior of his wife, and then he arranged, he, he told her, oh, your father is wanting you, you have to go home immediately. So she rushed home and then Ramanujacharya then arranged to take sannyas and left home. So these kind of examples are there. So it is allowed, as Prabhupada says here, if the home is not a fit place for human habitation, <laughs> right? The home is not a fit place for human habitation. We can be tolerant about our own interests, but we cannot tolerate people who are offensive to the devotees or to the Supreme Lord. Is that all right? Everyone clear about this? Yes, Maharaj. Okay, we'll go ahead. So then we hear about Vidura. Uh, Vidura is born from the body of Vyasadeva and, and is described he was not less than he. Who is Vidura? What is the identity of Vidura? He's Dharma Raja. Who? He is Dharma Raja himself. Dharma Raj? No, not Dharma Raj. He, he is Yamaraj actually. Yamaraj, that's right. Yamaraj, yeah. He's Yamaraj, right. That, he got cursed, right? Yamaraj got cursed by Manduka Muni. Do you know the story about the cursing of Yamaraj? Yes, Maharaj. You want to tell us? Uh, I think Manduka Muni, uh, he was. Um, uh, the king made him put in that lance, you know. Uh, he wanted to, the lancer, and give him the punishment. Then, um, but just when he was about to be punished, he could not be punished at all. <clears throat> so when he went back, then Emirat said that 
when you were a small child, you had <coughs> inflicted pain upon these insects. Uh, that's what he says. Right, yes. So, so he said, as a child, I did not know how are you giving me this kind of punishment. I was not aware of this. So he cursed him. Yeah, he cursed Yamaraj. And what was the curse? That you take the birth of a Shudra. Yes, you'd be born from the womb of a Sudra woman. And this turned out to be a blessing for Yamaraj. Uh, because, you know, the job of Yamaraj is not very nice. You have to deal with all sinful people. So Yamaraj was eager to get, a, get some break from all that situation, living in Yamaloka, not very nice place there, and Yama, the Yamadutas also, they're not very, <laughs> not very nice association. So Yamaraj was cursed and he became Vidura, and as Vidura he got driven out of the house by Duryodhan, and he took that opportunity to go and visit the holy places and to visit the holy places and associate with the great sages who lived there. And of course, Vidura got the association of Maitreya. I, first, he got, first he went to Uddhava and then Uddhava, Uddhava didn't accept him. But Uddhava he told him, he said, it wouldn't be fitting for me to instruct you, he said, because nearby is Maitreya, and Maitreya is senior. Uddhava said, Maitreya is senior to me, so you should go to Maitreya. So Vidura went to Maitreya, and we're hearing now about Vidura and Maitreya, their meeting, and what they discussed. So, uh, Vyasadeva is described here, he's an incarnation of Narayan, he composed all the Vedas, and Vidura is also a great personality, that he's, he's, he accepted Krishna as the Supreme Lord, and he followed his instructions wholeheartedly. So Vidura's, his activities are described, he had left everything and he was wandering in the holy places, and he, he, re, he came to Hardwar, and in Hardwar he met with Maitreya. So, Shona Karishi therefore asks, what more did Vidura inquire from Maitreya? Shonaka wants to hear, what did he ask? What did, because he knew, he knows they're both great souls, so when the two great souls meet, their discussions will be very fruitful and very inspiring to hear. So Vidura, what, Shonaka Rishi, who was in Naimisharanya and speaking to Sutta Goswami, he's asking Sutta Goswami, what did, Vidu, what did Vidura inquire from Maitreya? And in this purport, it's here in this purport, that Srila Prabhupada speaks about the going to holy places. And he quotes Naratam Das Thakur, right? Naratam Das Thakur, the great Acharya in the Vaishnava sect, and he, he says, Prabhupada says, uh, if one does not, if one, oh, what, what is it? If, if we don't go to the holy places to take instructions, and if we just go, go to the holy places just simply for traveling, then it's simply a waste of time. You go to the holy place, some people, they go to the holy place just to take a bath. Well, that's all right. Taking a bath, of course, is good, but there's more to be done in the holy place. And what is important in going to a holy place is to get the association from the great souls who live there. So Naratam Das Thakur, he has said that for the present, there's no benefit to go to holy places because in this age, in this age, times have become so changed, a sincere person may have a different impression 
on seeing the behavior of the present residents of the pilgrimage sites. So the pilgrimage sites, uh, Narottam Das Thakur didn't feel it was appropriate for people who were genuine seekers of the Absolute Truth. He didn't feel there was a lot of benefit for them to go there. He thought they might be misled. You hear from the wrong people. And we know when Srila Prabhupada was alive in Vrindavan, Prabhupada didn't want devotees to go to Radha Kund. And he told devotees very clearly, he told them many times, don't go to Radha Kund and don't associate with the Babaji's in Radha Kund. So, similar thing here, Naracham Das Thakur is telling also devotees, don't go, no benefit in going to the holy place. But Prabhupada does write, he does say, he said, to concentrate one's mind on Govinda in any place is a path meant for those who are the most naturally, spiritually advanced. It is not for ordinary persons. Ordinary persons may still derive benefit from traveling to holy places like Prayag, Mathura, Vrindavan and Hardwar. So Srila Prabhupada is describing, go, that if, go to a holy place, it can be good. It can be good for ordinary people. It's better they go. Because if they don't go, what are they going to do? They're just going to be at home. They're going to watch television. They're going to read newspapers. They're going to talk a lot of prajalpa, all gramya kata. But if they go to a holy place, there will be a lot of benefit. They'll go to see the temple, they'll go to see the deities, and they'll see the different sadhus, and hopefully they may even hear from some of the sadhus who live there. So it's very important that when you go to a holy place, you want to hear, you want to get the proper association, the proper guidance. We can easily be misled by hearing from the wrong people. You may have had some experience in this matter. You know, you go to a holy place and uh, some people are there, they're simply there to make money. Their business is just simply earning money. Of course, we go to a holy place, we are expected to give some charity. That is encouraged. Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati criticized his disciples when they were in the holy place and not giving charity. He said that particularly the poorer people, elderly people, invalid people, they come and they sit outside the temples and they're begging. And he, Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada said it's duty particularly of grihastas, that they should give some charity. Of course, charity does not mean big. You know, you give some small donation, nominal amounts, not big amounts. And people who are begging there, they're happy, they get something, a few rupees. They're begging, they just want to maintain themselves. And it is, the, it is our duty, come to holy places, we should give some charity to the temple, to the deity, and we should give also something to the beggars, like that. But the real purpose in coming to holy place, it's not just to take a bath, but it's to hear from the people there. That's very important. So Naratam Das Thakur said, oh, you can hear, you can fix your mind on the Lord in your home. You don't need to go to the holy place to do that. Yes, if you're a great soul, if you're very advanced, then you can think of Krishna everywhere, wherever you are. But not everybody's so advanced that they can do that. And as Prabhupada said, there is a lot of benefit to go to the holy place. Just a minute, let me close.
Okay, are there any questions so far? You're all right? So this first section, we're hearing Shonaka's inquiry. He wants to hear about the meeting between Vidura and Maitreya. What were they talking about? And Shonaka is a very powerful speaker. When he asks questions, they're very powerful and he asks them with a lot of meaning. And he describes here, in text number five, he said, the hearing of such narrations is exactly like bathing in the water of the Ganges, for it can free one from all sinful reactions. Right? We know bathing in the Ganga can destroy sinful reactions. Prabhupada says here, the Lord is absolute. There is no difference between his words, his perspiration, or his pastimes. The water of the Ganges, the narrations of his pastimes, and the words spoken by him are all on the absolute platform, and thus taking shelter of any one of them is equally good. Sometimes we say the water of the Ganges will purify only after a long time, but if you take shelter of the saintly person, he can purify you immediately. So even more powerful than the Ganga. But certainly water of the Ganges is very purifying. It's sacred water. And we do want to take advantage. All right. So be, text number seven. On being asked to speak by the great sages of Naimashiranya, the son of Ramaharsha and Sutta Goswami, whose mind was absorbed in the pastimes of the Lord, said, Please hear what I shall now speak. And so Sutta Goswami continued and he's describing about Vidura. Vidura, descendant of Bharat, born in the line of Maharaj Bharat. So he was delighted to hear the story of the Lord. He had heard about Lord Varaha and the killing of the demons like that. So this was very pleasing. Vidura was very happy to hear how the Lord had done this. And he wants to hear more. So Vidura inquires from Maitreya. He said, You know of matters inconceivable to us. So what did Brahma do to create living beings after evolving the prajapatis, the progenitors of living beings? So we're coming up to the real context, the main part of this chapter, we're going to hear about the creation of Brahma. We, we will hear for the, in creation there are two phases of creation. There is Sarga and then Visharga. So Sarga is the preliminary phase of creation, which is actually done by Vishnu where Vishnu creates the different elements of the material nature. And Visharga is a secondary part, Brahma's work as a creator. Of course, Brahma himself also has to take birth. He's not the original creator. The original creation is done by Lord Vishnu. So in text number nine, Vidura is asking, what did Brahma do to create living beings after evolving the Prajapatis? And then he asked more. He said, how did the Prajapatis, such as Marichi, Swayambhuva Manu, how did they create according to the instructions of Brahma? And how did they evolve this universe? How did they evolve the creation? In con was it in conjunction with their wives or 
did they remain independent in their action? Or did they all jointly do it? So this Vidura's questions, Vidura's put his questions and text number 12 begins, we're going to hear from Maitreya. And we're going to hear from Maitreya about how this creation all came about. Of course, you've studied creation quite a bit. You've been studying, hearing about creation in the second canto and then a couple of times already in the third canto. So you're quite familiar with the topic of creation. So Maitreya begins in text number 12 and he talks about uh, how the creation came, comes about. He explains, with, when the equilibrium of the combination of the three modes of nature was agitated by the unseen activity of the living entity, by Mahavishnu and by the force of time, the total material elements were produced. Right? The total material elements. In other words, what's the total material elements? How do we describe it? What's the te technical name? Hare Krishna Maharaj, is it uh, Pradhan? Well, Pradhan is an unmanifested stage. What's the manifested stage? Mahatattva. Yes, right. So this is the Mahatattva, right. So the elements were produced. So the Mahatattva were actually manifested, right? And why, how were they manifested? It talks about uh, the, the combination of the three modes of material nature agitated by the activities of the living entity, by Mahavishnu and by the force of time. So the force of time also is involved, along with the direction of the Lord, Mahavishnu, and the living entities themselves, all in conjunction with the three modes of material nature. So in this way the creation of the different elements of the Mahatattva came about. And then going on, impelled by the destiny of the jiva, the false ego, which is of three kinds, evolved from the Mahatattva, in which the element of rajas predominates. And from the ego, in turn, evolved many groups of five principles. So you'll remember, in the subject of creation, how these different groups of five came about. The groups of five, of course, being, well, you can, you can understand from the purport. There's the panchatattva, the, uh, the, there's the elements of the material creature, the mahabhotis, uh, the elements of the material nature, earth, water, fire, air, ether. They're all created. And then you have also the five working senses, you have five knowledge acquiring senses, you have five sense objects. And in this purport, Prabhupada mentions at the end, there's also, a, the, the, there can also be a fifth group, which are the five deities. We don't often hear of that, but there is sort of, you know, some people, they, they do worship the five deities, right? They, they worship the five different deities out there. It's generally impersonal. So all of these different things come about in the course of the creation, the elements of creation. Due to the contact with the false ego in the mode of passion, everything has evolved. The mind how, where does the mind come from? Do you remember? Where does the mind come from? It is coming a false e ego in the mode of... The mind comes from? 
mode of goodness. Yes, false ego in the mode of goodness. And intelligence comes from? Mode of passion. Mode of passion. Right, false ego in the mode of passion. Yes. Sometimes people are surprised like that. Okay, so the different elements of the universe are produced with the help of the Supreme Lord. And then we hear about a shining egg. The egg, the, these eggs are actually all universes and they appear. And these shining eggs, they, they, they lay on the water of the causal ocean. Causal ocean, the Ka Karana, Karana Drakashai ocean, the causal ocean, which Mahavishnu is residing on. And so the, the eggs, the, the perspiration which comes from the body of the Lord, creates these different universes. And it's described here that these universes are all floating on the causal ocean. So then the Lord expands himself into each of these eggs. And that expansion into the universe, this is Garbo Dakashai Vishnu. And he enters into each of these, these eggs as Garbo Dakshai Vishnu. And he's, from his own body, he creates water to fill up the bottom half of the universe, the Garbo Dak ocean. And he lays on that water and then from the navel of Garbhadakshaya Vishnu, we get the creation of Brahma, because the lotus flower comes out from the navel, and from the lotus flower, Brahma is born. And Brahma is described, omnipotent, the omnipotent Brahma. So, Swarat, the omnipotent Swarat, and Swarat meaning also independent, in the sense that Brahma is, he's the first living entity to take birth, so he can't depend on anybody else. So he has to be independent. The Swarat. And Brahma, he has to create the rest of the universe. He has to arrange for the bodies of the different living entities, and he has to arrange the planets, put them in position. And so he's a busy man. That's why the mode of passion, you can see Brahma's in charge of the mode of passion. And you need a lot of passion to do creation. It's a lot of work in the beginning to do something. So Brahma is in charge of Rajagun, and he's responsible for this for the secondary part of creation. Not the, the elements have already been created, so he's more like engineer. Engineers, they take the parts, put them together, and do everything. So Brahma's like that. Prabhupada writes at the end of the purport of text 16, he said, in Vaikuntha, the spiritual sky, there is no need of sunshine moonshine, electricity, or, the, or fire. Every planet there is self-effulgent, like the sun. Of course, in the, the universe which Garbhadakshaya Vishnu has expanded himself in, he has to arrange for these things. There has to be some sun, there has to be some moon. <laughs> Very important. But in the spiritual world, that's not a problem. So Garbhadakashai Vishnu lay on this uh, Garbhadak ocean and he enters the heart of Brahma. And Brahma uses his intelligence to recreate the universe. The nature of the material world is there's creation, and then there's maintenance, and then there's destruction. 
And then after destruction, after some time, then again there is creation. And then again maintenance and destruction. How is it described in the Bhagavad Gita? Do you remember what does Lord Krishna say? Describing the material world? The, yes, again and again the day comes and again the night falls. So this is the nature of the material world, very temporary. So there's a Brahma in each universe and they're given this kind of work. And Brahma is uh, the most pious living entity and sometimes even when there's no qualified person, sometimes Lord Vishnu himself has to take the position of Lord Brahma. So it's a big job. Generally, worship Brahma. You know, Brahma's worship is restricted to Puskar. Yeah, you know, a, a, a big devotee is doing a lot of, does a lot of service. He's busy in the matter of creating everything, recreating the universe. After the night of Brahma, there's a partial, with the night of Brahma, rather, with the night, there's a partial devastation. The lower planets are destroyed. And then Brahma has to recreate them again every day. And then at the end of Brahma's life, Brahma also has to think about that. The end of his life, he knows. He's not just always going to be Brahma, and he has to prepare for leaving his body and going out of the universe. And sometimes Brahma is a pure devotee, but not always. In the second canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, we heard about Brahma shaking hands with the Lord. And so they have friendly relationship. They're friends with each other. At least the Lord appreciated Brahma, who did so much tapasya in order to enable the creation to take place. So we're going to hear about Brahma's creation. All right, so. Here, text number 18, we hear about Brahma. First, first of all, Brahma created from his shadow the coverings of ignorance of the conditioned soul. They are five in number. And so this is an important point here in this chapter. The five coverings of the conditioned soul, which are the creation of Brahma. Five coverings of ignorance, and they are called Tamishra, Anda Tamishra, Tamas, Moha, and Maha Moha. Prabhupada hasn't put them into English, he's kept them in the original language. It's appropriate. So, Prabhupada does describe for us these different coverings here. We'll just read the purport in text 18 here. The first condition is a covering of tamishra or anger. Constitutionally, each and every living entity has minute independence. It is misused of that minute independence for the conditioned soul to think that he can also enjoy like the Supreme Lord, or to think, why shall I not be a free enjoyer like the Supreme Lord? Right? This is our position. We're forgetful about these things. And we were envious of Krishna. We want to be the enjoyer, like Krishna. So Prabhupada said, this forgetfulness of his position is due to anger or envy. We know in the Bhagavad Gita, 
Lord Krishna describes, because you're not envious, Arjuna, I am speaking this. Do you remember that verse in the Bhagavad Gita? Where does Krishna speak that? Where is Krishna speaking about not being envious to Arjuna? Fourth chapter. Really? I know it comes in the ninth chapter. I don't know about the fourth, but I know in the ninth chapter you have it. Nine one. Krishna said, because you're not envious of me, that's why I've chosen you to hear this knowledge. So envy. And Srimad Bhagavatam also is mentioned. Srimad Bhagavatam is for the those who have given up envy. Do you remember that? Where is that mentioned in Srimad Bhagavatam? Nirmat Saranam Satam. Ah, yes. Nirmat Saranam Satam. Yes. Which verse is it? Second verse, 1 1 2. Okay, yes. Do you know the verse? Do you remember? Yes, Maharaj. Go, chant it, let me hear. Dharma projita kaita vo atra paramo nirmat saranam satam vedyam vastavam atra vastu shivadam tapatra yon molanam shrimad bhagavate mahamunikrate kim vaparai rishwaraha satyo hridi avarudyate Oh, well, Mike, you must be a... <laughs> Who taught you all this, how to recite like that? It's so wonderful. My Siksha. Okay. My Siksha. Oh, you're very fortunate. Very nice, very beautiful. I'm so happy to hear that. No, I could, I could never think that you could recite like that so nicely. Wonderful. So, yes, Nirmat Saranam Satam. Do you know the translation? I can tell my own words, Maharaj. Yes. Um, so, this, um, the Srila Vyasadeva is saying that um, this particular Dharma approach, that this Srimad Bhagavatam is beyond all cheating religions. Dharma approach the Kaitamo, Atra Paramo. This is the supreme most. And this is for those people who are non envious, Nirmatra, and uh, pious Satam devotees, Nirmatra Nam Satam, Vedyam Vastavam. That means this is the, uh, this is as it is, this is the absolute. Vedyam Vastam, and it brings all auspiciousness, Shivatam, Tapatrayon. It removes all the miseries of all the, it uproots all the three uh, material miseries, Tapatrayon Unmulam. Srimad um, Bhagavate, this has been returned by the, uh, by the, um, composed, compiled by Shilavyasdeva in his matured age. So, what is the need of anything else? So, this, um, like that, it is Nirmatsranam Satam. Vedyam Vastam, Atravastam Shivadam, Tapatriyon Mundam, Srimad Bhagavate Mahamuni Krimva Parai. What is the reason? What is the need for any other scripture or you need not take shelter of anything else? So, in, in relation, just to ask you, maybe you can help me to understand this. You know, someone asked me, I wasn't quite able to answer, I didn't know the answer, but Srila Vyasadeva says, Mahamuni Krite. He de describes himself as Mahamuni. Is it appropriate for him to describe himself in that way? Um, it is not, in, that's what I heard Maharaj and I'm just repeating. Um, it is not that he is telling this out of his, that he is being proud of his situation, but it shows that um, he is confident of what he is saying. Uh, and uh, like he himself is an incarnation, so uh, he has realized this truth, so he is uh, telling it in this way. Okay. Thank you, Maharaji. Thank you. Very nice. All right. We'll go. So we're hearing about these five different coverings, uh, Tamishra, all right? 
Tamisha, this uh, mentality of being envious, the mentality of the living entity is hard to overcome. In trying to get out of the entanglement of material life, there are many who want to be one with the Supreme. Even in their transcendental activities, the lower grade mentality of Tamishra continues. <laughs> so even though we may be engaged in transcendental activities, we may still have this attitude, this Tamishra attitude, this envious mentality or idea of becoming one or being as good as Krishna. So this is the first covering of ignorance and then the second one, Anda Tamishra, involves considering death to be the ultimate end. Prabhupada went to Moscow and he met with Pro Professor Kutovsky there in the university in Moscow and, the, and Prabhupada was preaching to him and he was talking about, Prabhupada explained in, about reincarnation and how to take another body after death. But professor, the Professor Kutowski, he was a professor of Asian studies and he said to Prabhupada, he said, Oh Swamiji, at the time of death everything is finished. And Prabhupada laughed. Prabhupada was surprised. He was supposed to be a professor of Asian studies, but he was totally in bodily concept of life. And he was telling Prabhupada, Time of death, everything is finished. So materialistic people, for them, God comes as death to take away everything. So this is one another type of ignorance, under Tamishra. We're thinking that death is the ultimate end. And then the next one is, uh, oh, Prabhupada said, this under Tamishra ignorance is due to tamas, the existence, tamas, the existence of not knowing anything about the spirit soul is called tamas. So people in the mode of ignorance, tamas, tamagun, they don't know anything about the soul. They're simply absorbed in the body, in the senses. So this is another covering. So you have these different coverings, right? Under Tamijra, Tamas, and uh, so Tamijra, under Tamijra, Tamas, and then. There's two more. You have moha. Moha, meaning the illusion of the bodily concept of life. So Prabhupada said, as the attachments increase, so the illusion of the body also increases. We're thinking in terms of the body, everything, of, I am this body, this is mine, this belongs to me. My home, my money, my family, my country, everything is mine. And so that this is the illusion. We come to the world with nothing and we leave with nothing. What is ours? So we have to understand the nature of material life. But because of illusion, we're thinking, this is mine, I am the proprietor. And then the fifth kind of ignorance, maha moha, to be mad after material enjoyment. And Prabhupada said, especially in the age of Kali, everyone is overwhelmed by the madness, madness to accumulate paraphernalia for material enjoyment. Definitely it's true, isn't it? We, accum we accumulate so much, it's so easy to accumulate things. One devotee I knew, I knew, I know he, he was in the Middle East 
He told me he came to Middle East with a little bag, just with a few pieces of cloth. But when he went back, after he retired, he had a container. So that's the way of the material world, you know, even, probably even one container is not enough. You have so many things. This is the way of the world. We stay in one place, you accumulate more. It's actually a good thing to move. Every time you move, you lose things. And we are moving. We're all moving. We have to give up the body one day. All right, so five kinds of covering. Have you got them? Tamishra, under Tamishra, Tamas, Moha, and Maha Moha. We should be familiar with these kind of things. So out of disgust, Brahma threw off the body of ignorance. And taking this opportunity, the Yakshas and Rakshasas sprang for possession of the body, which continued to exist in the form of night. Night is the source of hunger and thirst. We never actually heard where the Yakshas and the Rakshasas came from. <laughs> we heard about Brahma taking birth, but we, we didn't actually hear where the Yakshas and Rakshasas came from. A little bit incomplete there. Anyway, uh, They sprang for possession of the body which continued to exist. The body which was given off by Brahma, it took the form of night. And Prabhupada explains the significance, or rather, Srila Vyasadeva explains the significance of night. Night is the source of hunger and thirst. Right? When we wake up in the morning, we're always thirsty and hungry. Yeah. Sometimes we hear people when they wake up in the morning, all they can say is chai, chai. <laughs> you know, they need their cup of tea or something. And we get so attached. Some, somebody told me one time, they said, I cannot get up in the morning without having a cup of tea. <laughs> this is the unfortunate condition of people in the Kali Yuga. We're so addicted to these things. So hunger and thirst, overwhelmed by hunger and thirst, they ran to devour Brahma, crying, spare him not, eat him up. <laughs> so they, had to, they were going to cook Brahma, they were going to eat Brahma. And so Brahma, text 21, Brahma is full of anxiety and he prays to them, don't eat me, protect me. You are born from me and have become my sons. Therefore, you are yakshas and rakshasas. So now we're hearing, actually, they're yakshas and rakshasas. They're born from Brahma. They're actually sons of Brahma. And they appeared due to the, when, Bra when Brahma was uh, performing this work of creation, first of all, due to the ignorance these two, th these two races came about, the Yakshas and the Rakshasas. So Prabhupada describes uh, the nature of these Yakshas and Rakshasas. So the ones who said that he should be eaten were called Yakshasas. And the ones who said that he should not be protected became Rakshasas or man-eaters. Therefore, yakshas and rakshasas are the original creation by Brahma and are represented even until today in the uncivilized men who are scattered all over the universe. They are born of the mode of ignorance and therefore because of their behavior they are called rakshasas or 
man-eaters. Are you familiar with any kind of civilizations like this, who are rakshasas? Anyone? Do we have anything like that? Yeah, it's, it's like, a, like, like, like cannibal, uh, Maharaj? Yes, right. Like cannibals, oh. yes. Mm. Rakshasas. And there were different kinds of civilizations where they would do these kind of sacrifices, you know, human sacrifices. Also, and even in India, you have some things like that, human sacrifices offered to, like, is it Kali Bhairava, Kali Bhairava, like, things like that, worshipping different demigods who are more influenced by the mode of ignorance. So man-eaters, cannibals in South America also, South America, before, before the Spanish went there, and the Portuguese, they invaded South America, so before they went there, the original inhabitants of that land of South America, they were something like that. They were somewhat bar barbaric in their ways, you know, they, they performed human sacrifices. But the Spanish came there, Portuguese, I don't know who it was, but some of them, they went there, they killed everybody. They just killed everyone. None of them survived. So, that's South America. South America is made up of all kinds of immigrants from all parts of the world. And you don't have any original natives there. Eh? All right, so we're hearing about the creation of Brahma. Text 22, he created the demigods, the chief demigods, who were shining with the glory of goodness. He dropped before them the effulgent form of daytime, and the demigods took possession of it. So the yakshas and the rakshasas, they took possession of night, but the demigods, they took possession of the day. So the demigods are born of the mode of goodness and the yakshas and rakshasas, they're born of the quality of ignorance. But the yakshas and rakshasas, they were the original creation. They were the first creation. So they're like the older brother, you know. <laughs> so we can see creation is a difficult thing. In text 23, Brahma gave birth to the demons from his buttocks, and they were very fond of sex. Because they were, so, they were too lustful, they approached him for copulation. So Prabhupada then talks about uh, the, this kind of nature that the background of materialistic life is there. The demons are very fond of sex, and the more one is free from the desire for sex, the more he is promoted to the level of the demigods. But the more we're influenced, the more we're degraded into demonic life. So we can understand how harmful it is for people to spend a lot of time watching Bollywood movies and this kind of television programs, because these kind of things, that they promote sexual affairs. And people become agitated and stimulated by that kind of association. So we always encourage people, try to stay away from these kind of things. The real education is not in watching Bollywood movies, but the real education is here in Srimad Bhagavatam, studying scriptures. We can learn everything which is important. So when they approached Brahma, text 24 describes Brahma first laughs, 
But the, the shameless asuras, they were not laughing, they were serious, and they came close to him. So <laughs> Brahma was afraid. So in that kind of situation, what should you do? Of course, the best thing you can do is to leave that place. Sometimes you may be on Sankirtan, like sometimes we go for Sankirtan, and we go and book distribution, we visit different places. And some places are, you know, they're, they're, they may be nice and pious and so on, but some places you go to, they're really degraded. And some places they they have all kinds of illicit affairs going on. So it's actually, you go into that kind of place, you just immediately turn around and go out. You don't wait around. We don't try to spend time there. We just, oh, okay, I've come to this kind of, get out, you know. We don't want to be involved, don't want to be influenced. So Brahma's in difficulty, so what does he do? He takes shelter, he approached the personality of Godhead and he asked the Lord for help. This is the nature of a devotee. When the problems come, we have to know, we have to take shelter of the Lord. So Lord Brahma, even if you're in the position of Lord Brahma, he even he, he has to turn to the Lord for help sometimes. So we, we have to develop that mentality, that mood of dependence on Krishna, that only Krishna can protect us. That is one of the items of surrender, that only Krishna can give us protection. And we should be convinced of that. So I've underlined a section there of the purport mentioning about the words bhaktanam anurup atma darshanam, which means that the Lord is always pleased to favor the devotee in the particular form in which the devotee wants to worship and render service unto him. And Prabhupada in the purport describes how different people will worship the Lord in different forms. We Gaudiya Vaishnavas, we like to worship the form of Radha and Krishna. But we know there are other Vaishnavas, they will worship Sita Ram. And there will be other people, they like to worship Lakshmi Narayan. And so there, there are different forms of the Lord. Some people are devotees of Lord Nar Narsimhadev, and others are devotee of Lord Varaha. So we can worship the Lord in all of these different forms. And the Lord is happy to reciprocate with the devotees. Oh, Prabhupada also talks about Rukmini and, and, and Dwarkadish. So the Lord is Ananta Roop. He has many different forms just to satisfy his different devotees. Just like Grandfather Bhishma, he was a devotee, he worshipped the Lord. What was the form Grandfather Bhishma meditated on? The four hundred letters. Four hundred letters. Yes, but particularly what was he doing? Huh? He's the coming, Lord. coming to attack Bhishma there with the chakra in his hand. Yes, he's actually he's meditating. Bhishma Dev meditates on the Lord as Parthasarati, the charioteer of Arjuna. That that was how Grandfather Bhishma perceived Lord Krishna on the battlefield of Kurukshetra. He was remembering the Lord in that form, Patha Sarati.
And so Lord Brahma is approaching the Lord for help because the sinful demons are attacking him. Well, they're not attacking him. They want to, they want to have sex with him. So, <laughs> so Brahma, being a demigod, he's not inclined that way. And so he, he, he's come to pray to the Lord to protect him. So Prabhupada talks about homosexuality and he says that uh, the, the homosexual, homosexual appetite of a man for another man is demoniac and is not for any sane male in the ordinary course of life. Actually, that kind of statement could get us in trouble nowadays because there's so many laws uh, favoring homosexuality, and that you cannot discriminate against people if they are homosexuals. Some countries, they have laws like that. And you go to countries like USA, and you often find there are big leaders in the government, and there are big officials like mayors of a city, and they're known to be homosexuals. And it's considered normal. People are like that. But Prabhupada certainly had a, he said, just people are not sane. It's just unbelievable. Just how degraded the world has become in just only 5,000 years of Kali Yuga. That men marry another man. And they, they actually have a legal marriage. They, they, they can go to a church or they can, have a, they can have their wedding to another man. And sometimes it's a woman marries a woman. We have these things going on in the world today. How crazy the whole world is becoming. And sometimes we get difficulties. Sometimes, you know, you get people like that. Sometimes they want to move into the temple. They want to come and live in the temple with us, and that, that can be a real problem. So how, how liberal should we be about these things? You know, if you were a temple president and you're running a temple, you have an ashram, and some man comes who's known to be a homosexual, are you going to allow him to come and live in the ashram? Any response? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. A person has decided to come to the temple. That means he would have given up that mentality, right? No. Doesn't mean that. Uh, Hare. Okay. Hare Krishna. Yes. Uh, actually, we should not allow him. No, not allow them because it will degrade ISKCON as an organization. But uh, as Prabhupada said in one of the, this one, that uh, Bhakti Vinoda Thakur, I think so, uh, same similar type of thing happened. What he said is that we should not allow them into the temple, but we should ask them to do the uh, this type, you know, the devotional service at home because we cannot deny the devotional service to them. They should develop the devotional service, but at the same time, Till they have that inclination, which they should not be allowed. Right. right. Yes, of course. We, we cannot allow them to come closely, too close to our devotees. We have to protect our devotees. When Prabhupada went to America in the beginning, in 1966, uh, there were some people like that who had homosexual tendencies. And they had they had even instances of it in the in their past before coming to Krishna consciousness. And it kind of, although they came to Krishna consciousness, it's not such an easy thing for them to give up. And again, the tendency can arise. So usually, you know, Prabhupada would encourage that. These people who have that kind of tendency, they should be married. But the problem is that once they get married, 
that it's difficult for them to be happy with the wife. That it's very difficult for the woman to put up with a man like that. And so although, the, although the, they would get the man married, often their marriage would not be successful. Anyway, it's Prabhupada said, these people are not sane, they're just crazy people. And he's, Prabhupada also said, Krishna consciousness is not for crazies, not for crazies. There were so many crazy people in, uh, in Prabhupada's time in, in the USA. There's many more now, but there were, there were many even in Prabhupada's time. And Prabhupada said, Krishna consciousness is not for lazy people or crazy people. So Prabhupada had some restrictions. They can come and eat prasadam, they can do some service, but they shouldn't actually be encouraged to come and stay in the temple. That's the point. Okay, so Brahma is praying to the Lord that you're the only one capable of ending my distress. And text 28, he says, uh, the Lord gives instruction to Brahma. And he, thought, he tells him, he said, then cast off this impure body of yours. And commanded by the Lord, Brahma cast off his body. So what does it mean to cast off his body? Does it mean he's committing suicide or what? Uh, Hare Krishna, it is leaving the mentality. Right, yes, he's giving up that mentality, changing his um, emotional state of mind. So he's casting that off, that's an important point, right? So the Lord asked Brahma to give up his present body because it had created the demonic principle. And according to Sridhar Swami, this reading from Purpur of text 28, Brahma's constant dropping of the body does not refer to his actually giving up his body. Rather, he suggests that Brahma give up a particular mentality. Mind is a subtle body of the living entity. We may sometimes be absorbed in some thought which is, which is sinful, but we give it up. The sin, we give up the sinful thought. It may be said that we gave up the body. So Brahma's mind was not in correct order when he created the demons. It must have been full of passion because the entire creation was passionate. Therefore, such passionate sons were born. This is a passionate place, right? The earth planet, a lot of passion. And so Prabhupada then talks about the importance of getting good progeny and how, how it's very important that Grihastha should be encouraged to do Garbhadan Samskar and in this way attract pure souls into their family. Everyone wants to have good, good children and we get good children by properly following the different religious principles. And, and Prabhupada says, when the society is full of good population, there will be no trouble from demonic mentalities. So we want to create like that, create a good, a godly civilization. Not a godless civilization, but godly civilization. We have that duty. And it's the responsibility of the Grihastas to produce nice quality children who can grow up easily to be... Prabhupada said even it would take us a few generations before we get that kind of thing. He told us in the beginning. So now we're already a few generations into it, so now we should be getting good children. So the body given up by Brahma took the form of evening twilight, and that's also significant because with twilight there's the mode of passion 
in the evening the demons become active in their sense gratification. So that form of twilight took the form of a, a woman and attracted the, the demons. We're told about the beautiful form of the woman and how she casts her glance everywhere and the demons are very attracted to her. Hmm. And the woman who was created was very expert in bewildering their minds and, and she was doing things like hiding herself as if she was shy and when the man sees that, then the, the man becomes even more attracted to the woman. So in the purport here, text 31, Prabhupada quotes Shankaracharya, who has advised that all persons not to be attracted by the interactions of flesh and blood. He should be attracted by the real beauty in spiritual life. And the real beauty is Radha and Krishna. One who is attracted by Radha and Krishna, they cannot be attracted by the false beauty of this material world. Right? We have the example of Yamunacharya. Yamunacharya, he had been a great king. Before he became Yamunacharya, he was the king. And living in a palace, he had enjoyed lots of heavenly sense gratification. But later on he had become disgusted with everything and he gave it all up and he took up the spiritual path and he became a great devotee and he lived in Sri Rangam and became known as Yamunacharya. So he had said, Yadavadi Mama Cheta Krishna Padara Vinde Nava Nava Rasa Damunyadad Yantamasi Tadavadi Bhattanari Sangami Smaranyamani Bhavati Mukha Vikarasastu Nishtivanamcha. So Yamunacharya is describing, he said, uh, since I have been tasting the nectar of the pastimes of Radha and Krishna, I have no more desire, I have no more interest in those activities which I had been engaged in before. And he said, whenever my mind remembers the things which I've been doing before, then my lips turn with distaste and I spit at the thought. So that was Yamunacharya's powerful realization. He realized the beauty, the real beauty of the spiritual world. In the first verse of Srimad Bhagavatam, Prabhupada also talks about this, how there is spiritual sex. The real beauty of life is there. And what is here in the material world, that is just a perversion of the, the minds of people with uncontrolled senses. So the demons see this form which had come from the which had evolved from Brahma's form, which had taken the form of the evening twilight, and they're very attracted to her, and they're lusting after her. And the young woman, the Asuras, treat her with respect, and they speak to her, and they're asking her, Oh, pretty girl, whose wife or whose daughter are you? And what can be the object of your appearing before us? Oh, you are agitating us with your beauty. <laughs> like this, this is the nature of demons. And the demons say, we're so fortunate to be able to see you. You have agitated the minds of all of us while playing with a ball. You have agitated our mind. And Prabhupada talks about how in the modern days it's common. We have these sporting events like tennis matches. People watch young women playing tennis. Actually, they're just looking at the beauty of the body of the young woman. The athletic, energetic young woman is there, dressed with a short skirt, and she's running around, and the lusty men all sit and look. 
meditate on the body of the young woman. So they call it sports, but it's actually totally mundane. It's totally ignorant. It's just ignorance. So if we want to get real enjoyment, we have to get free of the material existence. And that is the difference between the material world and spiritual world. Foolish creatures are enamored by the beauty of matter and think that the enjoyment it offers is real, but actually that is not real enjoyment. It is just simply the illusion, the illusion of pleasure. We're thinking there's enjoyment. There's no real pleasure there. Anyway, the demons are still attracted to this young woman. The demons, they don't understand this at all. And they're just looking at the young woman and talking to her. And they're seeing her beauty. So Prabhupada explains in the purple, he said, just like moths, just like a moth at night surrounded by fire is killed. So the demons become victims of the movements of the breasts of a beautiful woman, or the scattered hair of the beautiful woman, or afflicted by the heart. They all afflict the heart of the lusty demon. So these are points which are important that in culture society, the women will cover their bodies. They won't allow lusty men to be looking at the beauty of their body. The breasts of a woman should be covered properly. And also her hair, it should not just be scattered around. The hair is supposed to be tied up and right, like that. It's not supposed to be just hanging loose. Prabhupada says the beauty of the woman is in her hair. And the beauty of the woman is meant for the enjoyment of the husband, not for just every public man to see. So these are some important points in culture. We try to train young women to tie their hair up, very difficult. They don't want to do it. You, even you go to temples today, you see so many young women, they don't tie their hair up, they don't cover their hair. And often the, their, even their breasts are not properly covered. Okay, so then the demons understand, the demons clouded, clouded in their understanding took the evening twilight to be a beautiful woman and they seized her. And with a laugh full of deep significance, Brahma evolved by his own loveliness, the hosts of Gandharvas and Apsaras. So we heard that the, the, the demons, they, they got hold of the, the form of the beautiful woman. So then Brahma created the Gandharvas and Apsaras. And the Gandharvas are famous for music and dancing. And the Apsaras, they're expert in their... their, their is it the Gandharvas are playing instruments and the Apsaras, they're the dancers. So the Gandharvas are singing and playing instruments and the Apsaras are the dancers. So these people, of course, they're higher from the higher part of the universe, but they're very powerful in attracting people. So Prabhupada explains about music that's important, but it should be for the glorification of the Lord. Kirtan is good, but it shouldn't be mundane musical sound vibrations. So he created the, the Apsaras and Gandharvas, and then he gave up that beloved form of moonlight 
And Vishwavasu and the Gandharvas took possession of it. And then from Brahma's ne this next creation, we hear about the ghosts and fiends. He closed his eyes when he saw them because they were standing, standing naked before him with their hair scattered. So certainly something horrible when you see something like that. You don't want to look, just close your eyes. So Brahma, he did like that. The hosts, the ghosts and the goblins, hobgoblins, they took possession of that body which was thrown off by Brahma the form of yawning by Brahma. And Prabhupada talks about, he said, that this men who are impure, they will become possessed by ghosts and hobgoblins, and that will cause their insanity. So people actually often go crazy, they become possessed by evil spirits, and it's because they're not pure in their habits. They're unclean. They're engaged in all kinds of sinful activities and they're unclean in their habits. And so the ghosts and hobgoblins, they come there and they can enter into such people. So we should understand these things are not just talk, they're actually real. Text 42, Brahma, the creator of the living entities, evolved from his own invisible form, the hosts of sadhyas and pitas. The sadhyas and pitas are invisible forms of departed souls, and they are also created by Brahma. So Prabhupada talks about shraddha ceremonies, performing shraddha ceremonies for our departed ancestors. Shrad ceremony. We want to make sure that our ancestors have a good condition, that they've got a suitable body, because sometimes our forefathers, they may be in the form of, they may be ghosts or something. They're not able to get a proper body. They may have some invisible body. But if we can do some proper puja for them, do some shrad ceremony, then it can allow them to have a, a better existence in their future life. So that's common. Sometimes people also, they'll go to Gaya because the Vishnupada is there at Gaya and they will do puja there at the Vishnupada for the benefit of their departed father. But for devotees, that's not important. For devotees, you don't have to do that. Devotees, we just simply have to do devotional service. And by our devotional service, then all of our ancestors and everyone, they're all benefited. They're all greatly benefited by the devotion which we're offering to the Supreme Lord. There was an example, Prabhupada was in Los Angeles and there was a devotee, his name was Swarup Damodar Das. Later on, he went on to become His Holiness Bhakti Swarup Damodar Swami. He's now left the world. His samadhi is there in Radha Kund. But he was a very wonderful devotee. He was from Manipur. So he'd gone to America and he was doing his PhD. He completed his PhD there in Los Angeles in organic chemistry. And he was meeting with Prabhupada, and Prabhupada liked him very much, and Prabhupada really, you can hear many talks, like if you read the book, Life Comes From Life, you can read Bhakti Swarup Damodar talking with Prabhupada about scientific ideas on the origin of life. So he had many conversations with Prabhupada. So it happened that while Prabhupada was in Los Angeles, the father, of Swarup Damodar left the world and he received a telegram from Manipur saying, your father's died. So Swarup Damodar went to Prabhupada and he said, Prabhupada, I will have to go back to India immediately. I will have to do the last rites for my father. But Prabhupada told him, he said, no, no. He said, you don't have to do that. He said, you're finished with all that because you have a 
come here to Krishna consciousness and you've taken up bhakti yoga, so you're free from all these kind of material obligations. You don't have to do that. So one who is in Krishna consciousness, he's not obliged to do these kind of things. Right? Prabhupada writes in the purport here, the devotee of the Lord or one who is in Krishna consciousness, however, does not need to perform such ritualistic activi activities as shrad, because he is always pleasing the Supreme Lord. Therefore, his fathers and ancestors, who might have been in difficulty, are automatic relieved. And Prabhupada gives an example about Prahlad Maharaj. Prahlad Maharaj's father was Haranya Kashipu and he had been killed by Lord Nishringadev. So Prahlad was concerned that, oh, I don't, I don't want my father to go to hell because Haranya Kashipu had been fighting Lord Nishringadev and trying to kill Lord Nishringadev. Of course, Lord Nishringadev killed him but still, that was the mood of Haranyakashipu, and Prahlad was concerned that maybe my father will go to hell. But Lord Nishingadev said, no. He said, because, you're, because you are a devotee, he said, not only your father, but for many generations, all your forefathers, they're all delivered. You just have one pure devotee in the family, can deliver the whole line of forefathers. They can all be benefited. So this is the benefit of Krishna consciousness. Sometimes the family members say, oh, don't you care about us? Don't you do anything for us? You only do chanting Hare Krishna. You're always going to temple. Don't you do anything for us? You're doing the greatest things for them by chanting Hare Krishna, by serving Krishna. All of your family members are being benefited by your Krishna consciousness. All right? Do you believe it? Are you convinced? We should be convinced of this. The greatest, be so. the greatest benefit you can give for your family is to show them Krishna consciousness. Yes? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, be when you're practicing devotees, you're not in the pure level of Prahlad Maharaj. So what, what exactly we should do? Should we do that uh, final rites, all these things? Well, you're not on the level of Prahlad Maharaj, but your family members are also not on the level of Hiranyi Kashipu. Right? They're not big demons, you know. <laughs> you, you don't really have to do these things. That's the point. You don't have to do it. But if, it, if it's something which could easily be done, you know, if you happen to be there at the time, you could do it if you wanted to. You know, Prabhupada didn't think Swarup Damodar had to go all the way back from Los Angeles to India to Manipur just to do it. Nowadays they do have some Vaishnava Shrad, some Vaishnava version of Shrad can be done. You can do that. Rupa Goswami, Rupa Goswami, he had given different, or no, no, Sanatan Goswami, in in his uh, Hari Bhakti, Hari Bhakti, Hari Vilas, Vilas, Hari Bhakti Vilas, he described how we can do these different rituals in Krishna consciousness. Usually we do say it's the duty of householders to do these kind of rituals. Swarup Damodar was a, a brahmachari. He was a brahmachari, so he, he didn't have to worry. But people in grihastha life, in family life, generally they should perform these kind of ceremonies. The rituals, they're important. Something which uh, grihasthas, they're expected to do. So yeah, you can do it, but do it and do it. Don't do it with Karmakandi Brahmins. Don't go to the Karmakandi people to do it. Get a Vaishnava devotee to do it. 
if you're going to do it. If some, if you're going to get some, if you have to get somebody to do it, otherwise you can do it yourself. You can offer the food yourself to the ancestors. You can chant the prayers yourself. If you're going to get somebody to do it, get it done by a Vaishnava, a devotee, not just some karma candy. Thank you, Lord. Mm -hmm. Prabhupada writes, in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, the author says that a person fully conversant with Krishna consciousness does not perform any rituals because he knows that simply by serving Krishna in full Krishna consciousness, all rituals are automatically performed. <laughs> okay, so that's... If we're fully in Krishna consciousness, if we're conversing with Krishna con by serving Krishna in full Krishna consciousness, all rituals are performed. And sometimes, Hare yes, um, Maharaj, uh, like uh, what we saw now, uh, Prahlada Maharaj uh, actually Nashamadev says that for your. Uh, 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 that is the 12th generation, 14th generation behind and, you know, after also so be liberated, you don't have to worry. But at the same time, after that, in the seventh canto, it says that uh, Narsimha Dev uh, encourages him to do the Shraddha also. Is it uh, correct, Tapar Maharaj? Oh, really? It, it, it's yeah. in the Srimad Bhagavatam, seventh canto, it says like that? Narsimha yeah, Dev told what I heard in the lecture. Huh? Sorry. That's yeah. what I heard in the lecture, Maharaj, that even though he says that in the seventh canto, I believe they, he says that after he should he says that you have to do that one also. Just basically, just to tell, you know, just to show to the Arab, other people, in you know, for the people in general, that this type of things has to be done. Uh -huh. I, I, I'll have to check that, and I don't remember that part in the, in the, in the seventh canto, but I can look it up, I'll check it up, and tomorrow I'll tell you. I can confirm that tomorrow, but uh, it might be, it might be like that. That sometimes these rituals are done just for teaching others, for the sake of teaching others, for common people, that they have to be encouraged. Just like we see Lord Ramachandra before he went to Lanka, it said he worshipped Lord Shiva. So. They asked Srila Prabhupada about this, you know. Is it, you know, why Lord Ramachandra, he's the Supreme Lord, why is he worshipping Lord Shiva? And Prabhupada said, well, he's telling him, I'm going to kill your devotee. <laughs> that was Prabhupada's answer. He said, Lord Rama was telling Lord Shiva, I'm going to go to Lanka to kill your devotee. But another way of understanding it is, that Lord Ramachandra is an ideal king, he's setting an example for the common people. And for the common people to perform these rituals and to worship even gods like Lord Shiva, uh, it, it's kind of important. We want to encourage. Of course, it will be better if they worship Lord Vishnu, but still, something is better than nothing. If they worship demigods, then we hope that well, one day that they'll come to understand there's a Supreme Lord. But in the Vedas, the worship of Shiva is, Lord Shiva is encouraged. <coughs> so we, at least people are on the Dharmic path when they do these things. They're following Dharma, they're following religious principles, and they can go on to higher things. So they're, they're on the right path. They just have to keep going. So Prahlad Maharaj, of course, he's become the king. He's taken the, after Hiranyakashipu is killed, now Prahlad is to become the king. So the father's body has to be, you know, cremated or something. They have to do that. So. I don't know, maybe that was what was being referred to in the Srimad Bhagavatam, that 
you, because usually shrad is not done immediately after a person departs. But Prahlad has become the king, he's put on the throne and he has to perform the duties of the king. And you could say that's one of the duties, the, elder, the son has to take care of the dead father. It's a duty of the son to perform the last rites for the father. But if the son is totally renounced, then he doesn't have to do it. Prahlad, at that time, he was only a young boy. He was only five years old. And later on, he becomes a householder also. He's not renounced. He's not a renounced. He's a Mahatma, but he's not a renounced Mahatma. Right? There are two kinds of Mahatmas. Some Mahatmas are renounced, and other Mahatmas are in the family life. So Prahlad Maharaj, he, was a, he went into family life. So in family life, these kind of duties have to be there. Yeah? Okay, we'll go ahead. 44, Brahma, by his ability to be hidden from vision, created the Siddhas and the Vijadharas and gave them that wonderful form known as antardhana. So these people are described here. Antardhana, they're, they're perceived to be present, but they cannot be seen by ordinary vision. So, <laughs> special forms. Then, 45, Brahma beheld his own reflection in the water and, admitting himself, he, he evolved Kimpurushas as well as Kinaras out of that reflection. And these two, two races, the King Purushas and the Kinaras, they took possession of the shadowy form of Brahma. And that is why they and their spouses sing his praises by recur recoursing his exploits at every daybreak. So then Prabhupada talks about Brahma Mahurta, very important for us. Right? Spiritual activities performed early in the morning have a greater effect than any other part of the day. Isn't it true? Are you realizing that with Krishna consciousness? Yes, Maharaj. Certainly. Before we come to Krishna consciousness, we're often up late and wake up very late in the morning. So our whole life is very inauspicious. But we come to Krishna Consciousness and it's more early to bed, early to rise. And there's a saying, we say early to bed, early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy and wise. And Prabhupada said, it is a fact. It is a fact. If you lead that kind of lifestyle, you'll be healthier, you'll be wealthier and you'll be wiser. We, we need to make use of the morning hours. And the morning hours is Mango Arti, the Brahma Mahurta, these periods. Brahma Mahurta means one and a half hours before sunrise. That is the auspicious time of the day. Now some, part, some parts of the world it's not possible. There's some parts of the world, they have the midnight sun. <laughs> the summer, it's all sunlight and there's no darkness. And then the winter, there's no light, it's all dark. And so some parts of the world are in that kind of condition. However, more civilized places of the world, you know, we have the morning, the, the Brahma Mahurta period, which is about 4.30. Now Prabhupada always wrote to us, wanted us up by four o'clock in the morning. 
And he would always, when he would write letters to devotees, he would often say, I hope you're waking up early in the morning. Try to get, he said, you should get up by four o'clock in the morning. Sometimes people are astonished. They're amazed. What? Four o'clock? <laughs> you know, they're thinking so early. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> mm. They cannot imagine what to do at that time in the morning. What do you do? Of course, what are we going to do? We have a lot to do at that time in the morning. That's the time we do our puja, we do our chanting, we worship Krishna. It's a very powerful time to chant and to remember Krishna. And if you have that good program in the morning, if you get a good morning program, it will take you through the day in Krishna consciousness. It gives us that strength to go through the day without being too much disturbed by so many material things. So morning program, very important. And you can see in Prabhupada's, in the temples, in the morning program, they have all the elements of Panchanga Bhakti, right? Sadhu Sangha, Nama Kirtan, Bhagavata Shravan, Mathura Vasa, and worshipping the deity. It's all there in the morning program. Right? We need to always remember morning program. And then we hear Lord Brahma lays down, he stretches out his body at full length, and he creates snakes. And oh, Nagas also with ferocious, serp ferocious serpents, but Nagas with their hoods. Oh my goodness, this is all the creation of Brahma. And then we hear after the snakes, from his mind, the Manus. And the Manus promote the welfare activities of the universe. On seeing the Manus who had been created, the demigods, the Gandharvas, applauded. They're happy, they're, they're, they're appreciating, oh, this is very good, the Manus, you've created Manus, very nice, they're good people. We're glad that you've done something worthy of creation. So, in the purport there, the text 51, the purpose of sacrificial rituals is to revive gradually the spiritual realization of the living entities. That is the beginning of life within the universe. These sacrificial rituals, however, are intended to please the Supreme Lord. Unless one pleases the Lord, or unless one is Krishna conscious, one cannot be happy, either in material enjoyment or in spiritual realization. So, the important point is please to please Krishna. If we're not pleasing Krishna, then whatever we do is useless. The, our goal in life should be to please Krishna. Very important. How much are we pleasing Krishna? So that we can understand by how well we're following the different rules and regulations. And then 52, we hear Brahma creates the, the great sages. He was engaged in doing penances and concentration, absorption and devotion. And so at that time, the great sages came. They're also the sons of Brahma. Generally, the different bodily postures in the yoga system are accepted by less intelligent men to be the end of yoga. But actually, they are meant to concentrate the mind upon the super soul. After creating persons for economic development, who, do, who were they? Who did Brahma create for economic development? Manus. 
Manus, yes, right. Manus, because the manus got everyone doing rituals, ritualistic activities to help to produce, develop the economy. So after creating persons for economic development, Brahma created sages who would see the example, who would set the example for spiritual realization. So that's important. Set the example. You need that. You need to have these people showing the example. Our Krishna consciousness movement is meant for that. All right? And then final verse we have. He gave a part, Lord Brahma gives a part of his own body characterized by deep meditation, many other things. To each of these sons, Brahma gave different qualities to them. So to one son he would give his quality of tolerance, another son he would give his quality of concentration of mind, and another son he would give the quality of patience, and like that, these different, he gave each of his sons his good qualities, so that they could live properly in the world. And then Prabhupada talks about the importance of our regulative principles, that this is the most important part. To have peaceful mind, you want to have peaceful mind, you have to have proper action. And to have proper action means proper eating, sleeping, mating, defending. And to do that, to have proper eating, sleeping, mating, defending, we have to follow regulated principles. No intoxication, no gambling, no meat eating, no illicit sex. All right, are there any questions? Krishna Madhav Maharaj. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Uh, Maharaj, uh, now uh, Subhanga Mataji, Subhanga Mataji sent a link that is uh, the verses 7, 10, 22. It says that, my dear child, your father has already been purified just by the touch of my body at the time of his death. Nonetheless, the duty of the son is to perform a Shraddha ritualistic ceremony after his father's death, so that his father may be promoted to a planetary system where he may become a good citizen and devotee. Oh, okay. So it's right there, huh? Very good. Thank you very much, Mataji, for doing that. It's very nice of you. And so it's mentioned there in Srimad Bhagavatam, how to understand it. One thing is that that was not Kali Yuga. Kali Yuga, we don't have the Brahmanas, we don't have the really qualified people to do these rituals. That's a, one problem. So getting qualified people to actually perform these rituals is a problem. What is more beneficial for the departed soul? Sankirtan, the chanting of the holy name. So, that's one question I have. Yeah? Uh, one more question I have can I ask. Yes. Uh, in earlier in Canto two, we heard that all these ghosts, go go blab, go blabins, and all those things they generated from Lord Shiva. But now we are hearing in this this one that they are coming out from uh, you know uh, they are generating by uh, Brahma. So how should we understand this? Well. Gen no, I never heard that the ghosts are generated from Lord Shiva, but they're associates of Lord Shiva. They associate with him. Now, when he asked them to generate, that is, to um, procreate in the sense to get that time, Lord Shiva does that, no? Right? Sorry? Lord Shiva does, he produces uh, the ghosts. Uh, when uh, the, uh, the um, uh, population has to be increased, at that time Brahma says that uh, Lord Shiva, you take care of this, uh, this one, uh, population, he generates this. Yeah, that's what uh, I was understanding. Is it not correct? I've never heard that before. I don't know. Where did you read that? Where did you hear this? Uh, maybe that, that is wrong, I think, Maharaj. That is uh, second, uh, Canto's second when the generate the, um, this, uh, um, the secondary creation takes, you know, that time. Uh -huh. uh, Okay, then so, uh, that Lord Brahma then stops them, no? Then he says, you stop that creating uh, this one and then... Oh, uh -huh. you stop that creation. That was uh, Lord Shiva, eh? Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, I, I remember that point now a little bit. So, the initial creation, however, is coming from Brahma. But then later on, then Lord Shiva takes up. We could understand like that. The initial, but the initial creation certainly is there from Brahma. Lord Shiva himself coming is coming from Brahma. And so Lord Brahma, he, he, he would give these different qualities, different powers, he'd give them to his different sons. And so if Lord Shiva's creating ghosts and so on, then you could say that he's taken over that work from Lord Brahma. Yes. Maharaj, many times he saw Brahmaji could do the body, you know, very easily, give that mentality. But being a, being also living in it like us, practicing devotees, uh, do, uh, but it's very difficult to give, give us, you know, some mentality which you developed for so many years. So can you give some tips, Maharaj, where you can, uh, you know, get rid of that, uh, that bad mentality or whatever it is? <laughs> yeah. Yes, giving up our mentality, yeah. not so easy thing. Well, how could we do it? It's going to take time. We have to understand that Brahma's time was different from our time, you know? So we don't know quite how long Brahma took to give up that mentality. But we also, we have to understand we have some different mentalities. We have to work on it. We have to give it up. We know something is wrong, that something's not correct. We have to understand, want to try to avoid it. And so how to do it, how to give them up, just simply by focusing more in devotional service. The more we put our energy into being Krishna conscious, then all the bad things will automatically disappear. Any of the impressions which we have there, which are there in our heart, which are wrong, they'll all be removed by Krishna consciousness. So the, the real medicine, the real solution is just simply wholehearted engagement in hearing and chanting. This is the process to actually help us to give up all the unwanted things, what we would say generally anattas, right? They're all removed by devotional service. So we just have to in, immerse ourselves more fully in these spiritual activities. And the more we're chanting and hearing, the less time we have for maya. All the dirty things, they'll all be removed. The sun light takes away the darkness of night. So the son of Krishna will take away all the ignorance from our heart. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord Maharaj. The Srimad Bhagavatam is the sun, right? Krishna is as brilliant as the sun. He's arisen just after the departure. The Srimad Bhagavatam is as brilliant as the sun. It's arisen just after the departure of Lord Krishna. Okay, Prabhu, thank you. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj, for a wonderful section, Maharaj. Any, any other questions here? All right, so we'll finish and we'll meet you tomorrow morning at the same time. Yes, yes Maharaj. Manchakar Prabhupada. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Go back to the... <laughs>